Uh, good morning. I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center here at Brookings. Uh, there's a lot going on in Washington this week with the meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But fortunately, unlike last night's presidential debate, we don't have to compete with the Washington Nationals game. I do want to say that in a town where every day seems to bring more doom, doom gloom, and outrage, it was kind of a, a bit of joy to see the Nats win last night. So I hope we can keep that going, and maybe some of that luck will spread to Europe, and you'll have an easier job, Mr. Lane. Um, as you all know, the ECB is just 20 years old. It's an unusual central bank, manages monetary policy for a currency shared by 19 countries. Each one has its own national government, its own fiscal policy, and its own ideas about what the ECB should be doing anyhow. Uh, there are some experts in this town, probably some in this room, who thought that the euro and the ECB was doomed to fail. Um, I think it's clear that the ECB played a pivotal role during the global financial crisis, during the euro crisis that followed, and in trying to straighten out the European banking system. I think it's fair to say that the ECB and the euro are here to stay, but that doesn't mean that the ECB is without enormous challenges not the least of which is, to quote the summary of its last policy meeting, a protracted slowdown in the euro area economy, persistent downside risks, and an inflation outlook that continued to fall short of its aim of close to but below 2 percent. So Philip Lane's job is to fix all that. Um, since June, he's been a member of the ECB's six-member executive board and as chief economist, which is always an important role at the ECB. That's the person who presents the monetary policy options to the full committee. It's perhaps more important now with the appointment of Christine Lagarde, a lawyer by training, as the ECB's next president. Uh, Mr. Lane was from 2015 to 2019 governor of the Bank of Ireland and thus a member of the ECB Governing Council, its equivalent of the FOMC. And that followed a distinguished career as an academic, much of it at Trinity College Dublin. We're very pleased to welcome him to the Hutchins Center and to Brookings. He's going to speak. He has some slides. There are people watching online, so don't fall asleep. And afterwards, I'll come up and ask him some questions and then invite some questions from you. So with that, Philip Lane. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here this morning. So uh, I think my, my plan is in, in these opening remarks is really to provide you with a compressed uh, overview of the situation in Europe and the monetary policy situation and explain to you uh, why we made the decisions we made at our last monetary policy meeting. And then after that, I think it's probably more productive to see what, what questions you have. Um, so my, my focus is really going to be on, on the conjunctural near-term situation. The, uh, as David noted, uh, we've had uh, you know, a lot this year of a 20-year retrospective of the longer uh, perspective on the ECB in the euro area, and I'm also happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But here, as I say, I'm more focused on uh, the monetary policy issue. And essentially, uh, of course, when we talk about monetary policy, especially when the, our mandate is basically price stability, uh, the first chart to show is, well, what's happening with inflation. And what this graph shows you is the blue line is headline inflation and the yellow line is, is core. And essentially, the grand narrative of the ECB is in the first 10 years, uh, headline inflation averaged pretty close to the target. It hovered around one92 so if you like, uh, if you go back to 10-year assessments of the ECB, there was a high degree of satisfaction that the inflation objectives were satisfied. Uh, and of course, it wouldn't be too surprising during the crisis, or in, especially in the second uh, double dip uh, sovereign crisis in Europe, that there was some uh, downward drift in inflation. But in, in 2014, uh, especially, there's gathering concern that there was a, essentially momentum driving inflation maybe at, towards zero or even negative. So the big uh, shift in the ECB was in 2014, where the assessment was that uh, the risk of deflation, the risk of too low inflation meant that uh, the ECB had to adopt uh, the phrase of non-conventional monetary policies. And essentially, uh, I joined, as David said, the Governing Council in 2015, maybe a year and a half after this uh, 
intellectual decision was made. And through 2015 through 2018, I think there's a high degree of uh, uh, satisfaction that essentially the strategy was working. Uh, given the severity of the negative shocks and so on, uh, there was definitely a patient outlook that o only over time would we return to the inflation target. But the momentum was there. We, were, uh, we had uh, inflation move away from the zero deflation area, moving up and uh, to around 1%. And with enough momentum that our forward projections uh, had inflation returning close to close to the target, uh, so there's a high degree of satisfaction that uh, the decision to adopt more accommodative monetary policies from 2014 onwards did map into more stimulus, uh, lower financial conditions, uh, more rapid recovery in in Europe. So, for example. Unemployment, which was double digit, is now around 7.5. And this big recovery in the European economy, uh, of course, there's other drivers, but in part could be attributed to the decision to make monetary policy more accommodative. And uh, what's happened essentially this year is uh, there's been a reassessment of the outlook, uh, both for output and inflation. And in response to that reassessment, uh, we decided we needed to do um, uh, a recalibration of the monetary strategy to really reinforce the accommodation. So if you like, um, it's usually we talk about the forecast, uh, which is a point estimate, but it's important also to think about risk management. And what this graph shows you is what the uh, options markets are telling us about what investors believe might be the future for inflation. And the, the bottom colour, I'm not very good with colours, so I'm going to call that uh, orange, um, is you can see the, uh, the, bo the bottom uh, uh, colour is the probability mass on deflation. And in uh, 2015, that was spiking upwards, 2014, 2015, spiking upwards to around 30%. So investors put a significant weight that uh, Europe would go into a deflation environment. Uh, that was then essentially more or less eliminated by the monetary policy of the ECB. So until quite recently, the deflation risk uh, had basically been eliminated. Uh, now, towards the end of the graph, you can see that it's climbed up a little bit, but the bigger story is the gigantic mass, which is in the below 1.5 territory. So in other words, I think the, the, the investor assessment is uh, we think you're going to avoid deflation. We're not so confident you're going to get inflation close to but below 2%. And in that scenario, again, uh, it's important to take that seriously because we know everywhere uh, if in inflation expectations get de-anchored, if inflation expectations go too low, then there's a, a momentum in inflation which is undesirable. Um, now, let me talk about the macro situation and what we have is a very unusual situation. Is that the blue bar shows you, if you like, the quite strong performance in uh, 2017, essentially. End of 2016 uh, through 2017, the European economy was growing very well. So if you like, uh, <laughs> there was an assessment that maybe uh, there's you know, unusual temporary factors. So the fact that in 2018, the economy began to slow down initially uh, you could point, well, maybe this is partly just uh, returning to potential growth rate. Maybe we can point to some one-off factors. And there were some one-off factors like weather shocks, um, uh, some regulatory changes in the car industry and so on. Uh, but ba basically what's happened is uh, it looks like that slowdown is more persistent uh, than might have been assessed a year ago. And when you have a persistent slowdown, given the lead time in monetary policy, uh, then essentially the assessment is, look, uh, this is not, we can't just wait and see. We've got this persistent slowdown. Uh, we, need, we need to take that into account. But what's interesting about the slowdown is it's very sector specific. And I know it's very similar in other parts of the world, including the US, uh, which is essentially a dramatic reversal in, in manufacturing, in industry. 
but basically the services sector remaining quite resilient. That is uh, quite unusual. Historically, the correlation between manufacturing and services is really high. So if the shock driving the economy is a macro shock, like, say, financial conditions or other, some other shock which is basically pervasive across the economy, these sectors will move together. What we have right now is a shock that looks like it's disproportionately in the manufacturing sector. Now, there's obvious factors behind that. We know there's a slowdown in world trade, which is mostly in manufacturing, and we know uh, there, there are trade disputes in the world, which basically are about manufacturing goods and agriculture. Uh, so we have this asymmetry. Um, and so, for example, another way to look at it is the correlations between manufacturing and services. And what this shows you is typically the correlations are really high, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. They basically have come down a lot. And all of this is just saying we've got a big slowdown in manufacturing and services so far uh, remain quite resilient. Uh, and uh, you can see this also in the asymmetry in the leading indic indicators such as uh, PMIs. Uh, huge reversal in manufacturing, some slowdown in services, but more or less remaining in, in positive territory. So uh, we, th we think this is an interesting situation. It helps to explain why a, a big, because every day you're going to read a newspaper or look online and see some negative news about manufacturing. And the, with the temptation to extrapolate from manufacturing to GDP is many times maybe a good idea. But when you think about what's going on now, it's not necessarily going to be a good guide to overall GDP. Um, and so when you have a pretty strong services sector, uh, pretty strong consumption still in the economy, uh, what we're seeing is also going to come back to inflation, is the labor market remains quite strong and actually in an increasing way. So what this graph shows you, we've inverted unemployment to make it more easier to read. We've got this big improvement in unemployment from uh, above 12 to mid sevens. And for a couple of years, when we saw unemployment falling, we didn't see wage inflation. Because essentially, going from very weak to weak labor market doesn't create too much wage pressure. But going from uh, into a strong labor market, that's when you begin to see wage pressure. So what we see now is significant wage increases in the euro area, uh, in line with, if you like, versions of the Phil wage Phillips curve, which basically say when the labor market is hot enough, you do see that. So the transmission mechanism from a, a slack to wages is there. What we're seeing right now is uh, basically a lot of the wage, the increase in labor costs being absorbed in lower profit margins. And that's one of the big you know, debates about how much of that uh, is sustainable. I know there's a similar debate here in the US, but maybe the economics of uh, profit margins in the US and Europe are quite different, uh, given the different uh, uh, evolutions of profits. So if you like, there is a momentum in inflation. There is a momentum in the economy uh, excluding manufacturing. Uh, and so this is why, even though uh, inflation is essentially, core inflation is just kind of moving sideways around one, it remains the case we have a, a projection where inflation is going to climb over the next two years. So the yellow line is the current forecast, which says inflation is going to climb from, around, you know, core from around one to 1.5 over the next two years. And this is why it remains the case uh, that our, our outlook remains uh, less optimistic than before, but still a reasonably positive picture. Uh, we're not, we, we are seeing a slowdown, but it's not macro pervasive. Uh, we are seeing this momentum in the labor market. Uh, so we do think uh, the case is there. And these are, you know, if you like, uh, uh, we try and have robust forecasts. So these are not kind of on the edge of forecasting models. They're more or less in the middle of a different range of forecasts. Uh, so we do see a uh, climb in inflation. But importantly, compared to, say, December 2018, it's going to take longer. And you know, the two years ahead forecast is at now 1.5, when it was 1.8 from the point of view of last year. So again, this explains why we wanted to move. Uh, and then maybe the last piece of data that's interesting to think about is what's been going on in the uh, bond market. Uh, 
And this year has been very interesting, uh, both in the US and in Europe. So clearly, part of this is a global factor, where there's been a big uh, movement in, in the 10 years. And it's, it's very interesting to think about, well, why is that? One version is just the, uh, the world's in, investor community believes uh, the world's not going to grow very quickly. And also the world's investor community is, uh, puts some degree of pessimism about the uh, delivery of the inflation targets of central banks, uh, including especially the ECB. So we've seen this big uh, downward drift in the tenure, and essentially, uh, you know, to the extent it's signaling uh, a risk of de-anchoring of inflation expectations, it's signaling uh, a probability that demand will be weak in the world economy. Again, uh, that reading would reinforce the case for action. So we, we acted. We acted uh, in a package type way because, of course, when uh, you have already fairly accommodative monetary policies, uh, you do have to think about uh, making sure that the, the, the monetary space you have is efficiently managed. So the deposit facility rate, our key policy rate, uh, we moved down from minus 0.4 to minus 0.5. Uh, we restarted net purchases at 20 billion a month. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have this targeted lending program, Teltro 3, which we extended maturity and made the financing cheaper. And to uh, provide some relief to the banks holding excess liquidity, we exempted some of their excess liquidity from the negative rate. Um, and then, very importantly, so those are kind of actions we took but we also gave more detailed forward guidance about, well, what are our future actions going to look like? And essentially, uh, this is the most concrete version of forward guidance uh, that we have provided compared to the past, which is essentially saying uh, we want to see inflation uh, uh, converge uh, to, to our targets, uh, both in terms of the forecasts, but also in terms of actual inflation being close enough that the remaining gap between actual and projected is not too, not too distant, so people can be confident that these low rates will remain in place until inflation is really uh, can come back. Very importantly, this is state contingent. We're not saying this is a calendar, because the word is quite uncertain. So uh, some people choose to focus on downside scenarios, but let me point out there are also upside scenarios in the world, especially given when you have some of the reasons for the slowdown are political. Uh, discussions about the future of uh, European relations between the UK and the EU27, uh, globally in terms of the various trade disputes and so on. Uh, so those can be resolved in more favourable or less favourable ways. And this forward guidance is a, an automatic adjuster. If there's good news, the uh, rate, the date of liftoff will move forward. If there's bad news, the, rate of, the expected rate of liftoff will move uh, backwards. And then uh, let me say that this is not, this is a highly considered decision. We now have five years of data on these unconventional policies. And by the way, this year, when you had that really big move in the bond market, that is a very interesting piece of data and saying, well, what's going on this year? And so we are confident that these policies are helpful. We have a wide range. It's been a very creative and stimulating time for monetary economists. Mm -hmm. so, so the people uh, are very good staff, do all sorts of different studies uh, uh, to try and work out what's uh, the contribution. And if I focus on 2018, the most recent year in this study, uh, we're saying overall, if we think about it in terms of, um, say, the 10-year rate, we think these policies mean that 10-year rates are about 1.2, 1.3 percentage points lower than otherwise. And that's quite a lot of stimulus. That's quite a lot of stimulus. And we think uh, a, a large fraction of that is our asset purchase program. Um, but also we think that uh, um, it's been very helpful that the negative interest rates, uh, so there's a, a contribution from negative uh, short-term rates, and also from the forward guidance. Uh, so let me emphasize, for example, uh, the, the fact that the interest rate, the pass rate is negative with the forward guidance means we have this very interesting uh, pathway, expected pathway for future interest rates. So the market believes that 
Um, as of now, the deposit rate is minus 0 0.5. They believe that if conditions get worse, we may go more negative. So the, the, if you like, there's this belly effect in, in the uh, curve. They, they think a, a few months from now, maybe interest rates will go more negative, and then they will start to, rec to move uh, less negative over time. And uh, this is not saying we're going to do this, but the fact that the market believes we have the option to go more negative does mean that financing conditions uh, are cheaper than otherwise. Um, uh, we, we think the asset purchase program uh, ha I say has a, a big effect, especially at longer maturities. So when we look at the effect, when we buy bonds, how the yield curve responds, uh, we have this effect across the yield curve, but it's most powerfully at the longer end. Let me, uh, the economics of negative interest rates, which I know the US has not yet uh, entered into that, that world, uh, but it's, it's quite interesting because if you split up the area between the stronger and weaker economies, uh, you, you have seen in the stronger economies, banks, at least with their corporate depositors, being willing to charge these corporate depositors negative rates. So now in, the, in these countries, you know, a significant fraction of deposits is being charged at negative rates. So in other words, the banks are able to pass on the negative uh, rates to depositors, at least in the non-financial corporates. And what's very interesting, and this is a, a fantastic study using our bank level data by a group of uh, internal and external authors, the Alta Villa et al. paper, which you can, uh, is in our uh, published series. And what this shows is, if you look at country at banks which have been brave enough to pass along negative rates and those that have not, uh, in fact, those that have passed along the negative rates have been doing fine. They've been able to grow loans. They're, they're not losing depositors in any significant way. And this study tries to do all the causality and uh, controlling for sample selection and all of that that you can find. So I think there's a lot of evidence when you start looking for it that the negative rates are, uh, have been effective. We absolutely, uh, I accept every single side effect people list but you have to quantify all of those side effects against the fact that it does provide stimulus. Um, and so, uh, in the end, the core issue for us and for anyone trying to track, you know, are we hitting the reversal rate is, uh, are, are these uh, wholesale market conditions being passed along into lending rates to firms and households? Yes, they are. Uh, what you see here on the right, and even throughout 2019, so this is up-to-date evidence, we are seeing uh, the lending rates for non-financial corporates and for households coming down this year. So in terms of the transmission mechanism about making financing conditions for the real economy easier, it remains quite effective. Uh, and uh, I'll skip over this, but basically we also think the, the uh, targeted lending program is also helpful. And uh, finally, in terms of the interesting mechanics of excess liquidity, which, by the way, uh, because we're now restarting the net purchase, is going to go up now. So the black line is telling you the, the stock of excess liquidity. Uh, and what we've done now is we're saying uh, we're exempting a fraction of that. We have to set the exemption level uh, to avoid uh, having the interbank market get de-anchored from our deposit rate. And what the right graph shows you is basically uh, where, where the excess liquidity is does mean uh, that there's not going to be any deviation from, from the floor. Uh, but that, that's, it does provide a significant relief for those banks with uh, a lot of excess liquidity. And then maybe in terms of uh, what we care about in the end is, is this helpful for inflation? And, output? and again, this is a kind of a robust aggregation of a lot of different ways of trying to calculate it. We, we do think uh, all of these programs put together have had a significant uh, contribution to the recovery in European GDP and uh, the counterfactual where we hadn't done this, the inflation performance would have been significantly worse. So again, uh, we can all uh, uh, lament the, the world we're in in terms of uh, uh, super low interest rates, all of that, but, but we do think given the world we're in, the policy response we, we, we've taken has been helpful.
and maybe let me stop there to allow time for Q and A. Is we think uh, our assessment is this slowdown uh, can't be attributed just to one-off factors. There is a persistent slowdown uh, that, uh, as night follows day, has led to a delay and a partial reversal in the inflation pathway. So we have to take action. Uh, where we think our monetary policy is effective. And so we do, you know, we're not kind of, so it's not crossing your finger. We have the evidence that our monetary policy has been effective. Uh, with the forward guidance, it's basically saying, look, we're not just telling you what we're doing today. We're telling you what the future pathway is going to be, depending on the state of the world. And maybe the last point uh, is essentially we're also saying, uh, by the way, under these scenarios, with a slowdown and with a pretty horizontal profile for interest rates, fiscal multipliers for those countries of fiscal space uh, will be significant. And if governments uh, which had that fiscal space did uh, engage in counter-cyclical fiscal policy, it, it does mean our monetary policy would be uh, more effective because the uh, level of demand in the economy would improve. So with that, uh, let me stop. And, uh... Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.